My name is Jeff Morgan. I'm from Dallas, Texas, and I'm speaking very briefly on an attorney general opinion from Ken Paxton, attorney general of Texas. And this attorney general opinion was written on February the 22nd, 2019. The opinion number is KP-0241. And the reason I'm speaking on this is because on Wednesday, April the 24th, there will be two bills heard before the Juvenile Justice and Family Issues Committee. House Bill 2157, I believe it is, sponsored by Representative Mays Middleton, and also House Bill 3414, sponsored by Representative Scott Sanford. Both of these bills pertain to the issue of equal shared parenting in the state of Texas. And I think that this opinion that Attorney General Ken Paxton has written is very important to this topic. Attorney General Paxton was asked by Representative James White to opine on standards the courts apply when balancing the rights of the state against the fundamental rights of parents to raise their children free from government intrusion. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment protects fundamental parental rights. And this again is by Attorney General Ken Paxson of the State of Texas. Attorney General of the State of Texas. Number one, courts have long held that the natural right existing between parents and their children is of constitutional dimensions. In other words, you have a constitutional right to parent your children. Number two, and this is very important because somehow, sometimes the state thinks that maybe it knows the best interest of the children. It can interfere in a parent-child relationship and uh, it asserts itself in ways that it should not. So the point number two is this. The child is not a mere creature of the state. Those who nurture him and direct his destiny, and that can be either him or her, have the right, coupled with the high duty, to recognize and prepare him for additional obligations. So it is the parent, parent's right and duty to prepare their children for additional obligations in that child's life. Number three, the court has held that the interest parents possess with regard to their children is a fundamental liberty interest protected by the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment protects the fundamental right of the, of the parents possess with regard to their children. It is a fundamental liberty issue. Following up with this is point number four. The Due Process Clause provides that no state, no state, no state, not even the state of Texas, shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And it continues on to say that in addition to guaranteeing fair process, the court has held that this clause includes a substantive component that forbids the government from infringing upon certain fundamental, such as a parental right, and it prohibits the state, the government, from infringing upon certain fundamental liberty interests at all. The state is not even allowed to get involved in certain fundamental liberty issues, no matter what process is provided, unless the infringement is narrowly tailored to serve the, a compelling state interest. Now, it so happens that in the Texas Family Code, the uh, section 153.001, the public policy of the state is to, number one, assure that children will have frequent and continuing contact with parents who have shown the ability to act in the best interest of the child. Now, first off, let me go back to this. With parents who have shown the ability to act in the best interest of the child is not what this is referring to. His general, his, the Attorney General's opinion does not stipulate that. It talks about parents. The Texas Family Code has tried to sneak this in there to find a way so that the government can intrude into your family. And by the way, the public policy of the state is to provide a safe, stable, and nonviolent environment for the child and encourage parents to share in the rights and duties of raising their child, parents to raise their child, not a mother to raise her child or a father to raise his child, parents, parents, both father and mother, to raise their child after the parents have separated or dissolved their marriage. So once again, to go back to uh, section 153.001 about the public policy, the public policy of the state is to assure that children have, will have frequent and continuing contact with parents, period. That is where it should end. The Texas Family Code has added this phrase, who have shown the ability to act in the best interest of the child. 
First off, according to Troxel, and Troxel is an opinion I don't even like. Troxel states that a fit parent is presumed to act in the best interest of the child. So in other words, the state must prove that the, ch that the parent is not acting in the best interest of the child. Rather than having the parent prove that somehow he or she is acting in the best interest of the child. The parent should be judging the judge, not the judge judging the parent. That's the way that it should be. That is what the Supreme Court decision says. That is what the Attorney General has opined on. The Texas Family Code is an error in this point. When it tries to say that somehow the, the state gets to say that only parents who act in the child's best interest, who have the ability to act in the children's best interest, shall have frequent contact, frequent and continuing contact with their children. It is presumed that a fit parent will act in the best interest of the child. If there is any, con if there is any situation in which this is not the case, the state has the burden of proof to show that. It is not assumed otherwise. The state must make its case and prove it. And to continue on with the best interest of the child, in section 153.002, the best interest of the child. The best interest of the child shall always be the primary consideration of the court in determining the issues of conservatorship and possession of and access to the child. This is a big farce that the Texas Family Code is throwing out there. And I believe that the reason it's throwing it out there is so that attorneys can continue to profit financially rape your family and profit by fighting over what is in the best interest of the child. Number one, in the Texas Family Code, which is about 1,525 pages, the idea of the best interest of the child, as it is right here in section 153.002, is mentioned at least or approximately 140 times. Yet nowhere, nowhere, nowhere in the Texas Family Code is the best interest of the child defined. The best interest of the child is an opinion. It is a whim. It is what one person thinks the best interest of the child might be. I will get back to this best interest of the child in a few moments because I believe even the Attorney General's opinion shows that the best interest of the child is a farce, is a sham, and it is a racket that the family courts have established to pillage parents of their finances and also to pre prohibit them from genuinely interacting and guiding their children in a matter in which they deem fit. To go back to the Attorney General's opinion, the fifth point about the due process clause is that the court has long held, long held, that among fundamental, fundamental rights protected by the due process clause are certain fundamental parental rights. So once again, what is the Texas Family Code saying that we can somehow determine whether a parent acts in the best interest of the child? If a parent is a fit parent, the Supreme Court has held even in a decision that I do not like, Troxel v. Granville, that a fit parent presumes to act in the best interest of the child. The burden of proof is upon the state to prove otherwise. The due process clause of the 14th Amendment protects fundamental parental rights. Now, the Attorney General elaborates on that in four additional points. First point is this. The due process protects the right of parents to make decisions regarding the care custody and control of their children. And once again, this does not say the due process clause protects a mother to make decisions regarding her child, or does not say that the due process clause protects a father to make decisions regarding his child. It protects the rights of parents, both parents, regarding care, custody, and control of their children. Second point is this, the due process protects the right of parents to direct the upbringing and education of their children. The third point is this. Due process protects the right of parents. Once again, it's neither male nor female. It's neither mother or father. It's not saying the better of the two parents. Parents, if you are a parent to the child, you have this fundamental right protected to make medical decisions on behalf of your children. Number four. Due process coupled with the First Amendment, the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment of the 14th, uh, and the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment protects the right of parents to guide the religious education and training of their children. Uh, and the second major point is this, as a general matter, courts apply strict scrutiny 
to review state statutes that infringe upon fundamental parental rights. So what exactly does that mean? Attorney General Paxton continues on and says we can provide guidance on the general standards courts use to balance these interests and then discuss certain contexts where the courts may apply additional standards. What is this may apply additional standards? What context does the courts have to apply additional standards? If this is an extra constitutional phraseology that he's adding into his opinion that somehow we've accepted because it's become because it's been because the society has been brainwashed to accept it. Anyway, he continues on further. And once again, I said Traxel v. Granville is a disaster in my opinion, but it is a Supreme Court decision. And one of the things that it says is that there will normally be no reason, normally be no reason for the state to inject itself into the private realm of the family to further question the ability of that parent to make the best decisions regarding the, re the rearing of that parent's children. The reason I don't like Troxel versus Granville is because this was only talking about one parent, the mother, because the father had committed suicide. Now the mother is giving sole right to direct her children and the father and his interests have been completely disregarded. Regardless, the idea behind this is the parents have a right to make the best decisions without interference by the state. He continues even further. Parental rights are fundamental. Parental rights are fundamental. However, neither the Texas Family Code nor the Constitution treats them as plenary and unchecked. And we can live with that. That no parent has the right, for example, to abuse a child. No parent has, a ch has the right to sell the child into sexual slavery or use him or her for whatever means he wants to. The child is an individual, not a piece of property. The state does have a certain right to check the parental rights. And he continues on further and says the state is not without constitutional control over parental discretion in dealing with children when their physical or mental health is jeopardized. So what the Attorney General is saying is if, as I mentioned, a child's physical health is being jeopardized because of, say, perhaps child abuse, his mental health is being jeopardized for I don't know what all this means exactly, the state has a right supposedly to inject itself into that situation. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the state must use strict scrutiny. What does this mean? The government must prove that the restriction furthers the compelling interest and is narrowly tailored, narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. It cannot be broad-based. It cannot be widely applied. It must be narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Consistent with the standard of review, Texas courts and this office recognize the state statutes that infringe upon a parent's right to control the care and custody of his or her children are subject to strict scrutiny. The Attorney General is saying right here, the state can't do something, but you need to check us. You need to examine us. If we are not following the strict scrutiny standard, you have every right to protest us, and I would even say to sue us. Because if the state is acting in an unconstitutional manner, it is acting in an unconstitutional manner. It cannot just say, well, we have sovereign immunity to act in an unconstitutional manner. It must abide by the Constitution. Point number three that Attorney General Paxton writes is this. Certain contexts regarding child custody determinations may warrant the application of additional standards. My first question is, where in the Constitution is this derived from? Is this somewhere in the United States Constitution that um, child custody determinations may warrant the application of additional standards? Or did the state of Texas just make this up out of convenience, perhaps? The courts have unconstitutionally adopted this line of reasoning. There is no right for the state to do this. But the Attorney General goes on further and says, when a court resolves disputes concerning conservatorship, and possession of a child, the court bases those decisions on the best interest of the child. This is hogwash. It is nonsense. It is a sham. It is a lie. It is nice flowery phraseology. It means nothing.
Once again, going back to the Texas Family Code, 1,525 pages of whatever it is you want to call it, whether you worship the family Texas Family Code or whether you think that there's a lot of mess in this Texas Family Code, 1,525 pages, at least 140 times the best interest of the child is referred to. The best interest of the child shall always be the primary consideration of the court in determining issues of conservatorship and possession of and access to the child. Somewhere this needs to be defined. It cannot just be an outsider's opinion, which is actually what happens. So the Attorney General appears to address this argument. Um, because after saying that, you know, a court resolves disputes concerning conservatorship and possession of a child, and the court bases those decisions on the best interests of the child, he now talks about factors that the Texas Supreme Court has provided that may be a non-exhaustive list of factors to consider in ascertaining the best interest of the child. Number one, the desires of the child. Wow, this is amazing. The Texas Supreme Court has said, whatever the child wants shall be considered. The child becomes the parent over top of the parents. It's not the other way around. A normal relationship has parents and children underneath. Parents provide guidance and direction and care and love and everything else. But now somehow we've got to say, no, 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 no. Whatever the child desires needs to be considered in the best interest of the child. The child may be desiring the wrong thing, which is why you have parents to help correct the child. But the child gets preferential treatment in the best interest of the child. Now we talk about the emotional and physical needs of the child now and in the future, and the emotional and physical danger to the child now and in the future. Okay, let's talk about the emotional and physical needs of the child now and in the future. The emotional needs of a child are to be attached to both parents. To have, actually, the emotional needs of the child would be to be in a 100, 100% shared parenting relationship with both parents, period. Mother and father, to be raised in an intact family. When divorce occurs, and because Texas has this no-fault division, this no-fault divorce, this idea that somehow we can file for divorce, nobody's at fault, where is the parent at fault? The, the lawsuit and no-fault divorce is between two parents. It has nothing to do with parental abilities. It has to do with the relationship between two spouses. So why is the state of Texas taking a no-fault divorce and now applying it to take a child away from one of the parents? This is the hypocrisy and the lunacy of no-fault divorce. If you want to say that perhaps one parent is better than the other, we need to go back to a fault-based system. Or at least we need to have a mutual no-fault divorce system where both parents agree on it and at the same time the standard would be 50-50 rebuttable presumption of parenting. That's all there is to it. A parent should not lose access to his or her child because one spouse wants to sue the other one for divorce. Period. The emotional and physical danger of the child now and in the future. What does this mean? In a divorce, if there's no fault, if there's no danger, this nonsense should be scratched out. The parental abilities of the individuals seeking custody. What does this mean? Once again, the lawsuit is talking about two spouses filing for divorce or maybe one spouse forcing divorce on the other parent, uh, on the other spouse, and now we're gonna include parenting in this? This is nonsense. You're talking about this relationship here, not this relationship, parent and child. This whole thing is nonsense. Number, point number five is, the programs available to assist these individuals to promote the best interest of the child. What in the world is the best interest of the child? And let me take this a step further. Dr. Edward Cruck, PhD out of University of British Columbia, founder of the International Council of Shared Parenting, deemed to be an expert in his field, says nobody even knows what the best interest of the child really is. There is no agreement on the best interest of the child. Furthermore, as we see right here in the Texas Family Code, they talk about the emo emotional and physical needs of the child. But what they, to look only at the physical and emotional needs is to denigrate what the child really needs. The child needs love and nurture, needs moral training, needs spiritual guidance. To just pretend that the best interest of the child focuses solely around physical needs and emotional needs is nonsense. The child has social needs, the child has moral needs, the child has spiritual needs. This whole idea of the best interest of the child 
is complete garbage as it is written right here. The plans for the child by these individuals or, oh, 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 oh here comes a new one, or the agency seeking custody. Now we have a divorce situation and an agency such as CPS may come in and take the children and maybe put that child into foster care. One interesting thing about CPS and foster care uh, is that I spoke with a person from the U.S. Institute Against Human Trafficking and they asserted to me that 60 to 70 percent of the children that are victims of human trafficking come from foster care. And it's very interesting to me that the Attorney General is very concerned about human trafficking and the state of Texas is very concerned about human trafficking. And Governor Greg Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and the, I'm sure the Speaker of the House and all of our representatives and all of our senators are very concerned about human trafficking. And yet, they keep funding CPS, which takes children out of homes, often needlessly, puts them into foster homes, and 60 to 70 percent of the children that are involved in human trafficking come from these foster care situations. If you want to decrease human trafficking, get rid of CPS and their ability to take children from parents. But we must remember that the best interest of the child may include the plans that the agency seeking custody, such as CPS, has for the child. We may also, conclude this, we may also include the stability of the home or proposed placement. Placement? What is this placement stuff? The same thing with CPS. And by the way, the stability of the home. The way divorce works in Texas, usually divorce causes instability. If Texas is really concerned about the stability of the home, they would stop granting divorces so easily. That's the reality of it. This whole thing is nonsense. The acts or omissions of the parent may indicate that the existing parent-child relationship is not a proper one. Now, wait a minute. Has the state of Texas met the burden of proof that the parent is an unfit parent. Because if the parent is not an unfit parent, Troxel v. Granville states that a fit parent is presumed to act in the best interest of the child. The state of Texas is, is unconstitutionally infringing itself upon the parent-child relationship when it says that we need to judge the acts or omissions of the parent, which may indicate that the existing parent-child relationship is not a proper one. Perhaps we should start judging the uh, government citizen relationship to find out whether that government citizen relationship is not a proper one because right here it is not a proper relationship any excuse for the acts or omissions of the parent so in other words what the state of Texas appears to be saying is if you are not a perfect parent and I would like to know governor lieutenant governor speaker of the house representatives senators all of these great judges attorneys family law attorneys who are there looking out for the best interests of the child are you perfect parents CPS workers, are you perfect parents? Well, the reality is many of the CPS workers are not even parents, period. Never have been parents. Many don't even have college education. But somehow they are going to judge parents and look for the excuses on whether that parent has committed any acts or omissions as a parent. This is garbage. Unless you are willing to subject yourself to the exact same treatment, you should not be doing this to parents and to the parent-child relationship. Now, here we go a little bit further. But before permanently severing parental rights, the state must provide clear and convincing evidence that the termination is warranted. Let us go back to what Attorney General Ken Paxson said at the beginning. Parenting is a fundamental right. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment protects fundamental parental rights. Strict, strict scrutiny must be applied in when the state interferes in the exercise of fundamental parental rights. It's like we've ignored all of this and now we're going to say now the, the state must provide clear and convincing evidence that the termination is warranted. Strict scrutiny is up here. Have you yet determined that a parent is unfit and if so by what standard? By what standard are you determining that the parent is unfit? Because again Troxel B. V. Granville says a parent is presumed to be fit, and a fit parent is presumed to act in the best interest of the child. State of Texas, you are actually violating parents' rights and the parent-child relationship. You should not be inserting yourself. This activity that you are engaging in is criminal and illegal. So, oh, now he does go further and says the courts presume that fit parents act in the best interest of the child. Well, thank you, Attorney General Ken Paxson, for actually mentioning this. The courts do presume that. 
But, however, um, it appears that that's only in language only. The reality is that the state often interferes, and the state often makes det determinations reserve regarding custody, which are unconstitutional and an egregious power grab. And I would even say that in part it's because of the funding that accompanies making unequal custody decisions, which I will get back to in a moment. The Attorney General writes in evaluating parent-child relationships before making decisions about an access to the child, the state should not even be doing this. The state should not be doing it. But now it's saying we have to look out for the kids. We have to violate the, the fundamental rights of parents because the kids need us right now. We will sever a relationship if necessary. We will make unequal parenting so that instead of a parent, a child having access to his parent 100% of the time as a 100-100 shared parenting, as in a normal marital relationship, no, 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 we need to punish that child and the parent by making that other parent a visitor in that child's life, and by the way, causing that parent to pay child support, which is a different issue altogether in itself. The law's concept of the family rests on a presumption that parents possess what a child lacks in maturity, experience, and capacity for judgment required for making life's difficult decisions. More importantly, historically, it has recognized that the natural bonds of affection lead parents to act in the best interest of the child. Due to this presumption, the state may not, may not infringe upon the fundamental right of parents to make child-rearing decisions simply because a state judge believes a better decision could be made. So why is any state judge at all making a determination of the best interest of the child. Unless the state and unless that judge has evidence to prove that the parents are unfit, the judge has no right to make this, to make this determination that somehow he knows the best interest of the child. He can make a better interest, a better decision regarding the parent-child relationship. So long as a parent is fit, which a parent is presumed to be fit, according to Troxel v. 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 Granville, there will normally, oh, normally? No, not normally. There should be no reason for the state to inject itself into the private realm of the family to further question the ability of that parent to make decisions concerning the rearing of that parent's children. These equal shared parenting bills are going to be discussing the issue of whether both parents, both parents, should have this input into children's lives. Whether both parents should be responsible for the moral, the social, the emotional, the physical, the spiritual upbringing of the child. Not just one. The Attorney General's website even say, says right now that in approximately 90% of the cases, mothers have custodies. I am not anti-mother. I am not anti-father. I am both pro-mother and pro-father. And I am pro-mother and pro-father together in an intact family so that they can provide that which is the best interest of the children. By the way, to go back to the Texas Family Code, in section 153.003 regarding the issue of um, the best interest of the children in custody and stuff like that, no discrimination based on sex or marital status. Wow. No discrimination based on sex or marital status and yet the Attorney General so website states that uh, in approximately 90% of the cases, mothers have primary custody. Once again, I am not anti-mother and I am not anti-father. I am pro-mother and pro-father. The child needs both parents in their lives. The best situation for a child to be raised is with a mother and a father in an intact marriage, in an intact family, mother and father who learn how to get along, mother and father who we hope love each other, mother and father who have common goals we hope, not a mother or not a father, not a single parent, and the state should not be interfering in the realm of the parent-child relationship. If the state wants to keep us no-fault divorce laws, the state has no option but to say that equal shared parenting is the only way to go. If the state wants to go back to fault-based divorce laws, get rid of unilateral, which is forced divorce, 
Um, and then go to a fault-based system, the state might be able to apply some of these other standards. So for example, if a father or a mother abandons the family, destroys the family, and then says, I'm acting in the best interest of the child, the judge could easily say, no, you are not. But in a situation with no fault divorce, no fault divorce, nobody's at fault. It just didn't work out. That is a case against one spouse against another, maybe both spouses agree, maybe one spouse is forcing it. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the parent-child relationship. Any laws that would be contrary to 50-50, rebuttable presumption of 50-50 shared parenting in a no-fault divorce state are the only laws that could possibly be applied. Other than that, the state of Texas is acting as if it knows best for the children, and yet, and it is violating the fundamental rights of parents, both parents, to parent their child, children. And it is also violating, in many instances, due to the statistical nature of, due to the, the current status of things, it is violating the no discrimination based on sex or marital status uh, mentioned in section 153.003. For those people who will be down there testifying on House Bill, again, House Bill 2147, and House Bill 3414, I wish you all the best. I hope that this monstrosity that some of these people in our government worship, this Texas Family Code, which itself is anti-constitutional in certain aspects, that you can show them this, you can help bring some sanity to these people down there, and that you will get what you're looking for so that both a father and a mother can have important access and input into the lives of their children. Thank you.